Hi folks, welcome. My name is Daniel Roth. I'm a program manager on the ASP.NET team. And in this session, we're going to be talking about what's new in ASP.NET Core. Hopefully you heard earlier today at the keynote that ASP.NET Core 2.2 Preview 2 is now available for you to download, to install, and to try out. In this session, I'm going to talk about many of the new features that are now available with this preview release. And I'll also talk about some of the additional investments that we're planning to make uh, for the final 2.2 release. To get started with ASP.NET Core 2.2 Preview 2, you're going to want to go and download and install the latest .NET Core SDK, the 2.2 Preview 2 SDK. You can get that from the .NET website uh, and install the uh, Preview 2 version. Uh, if you want to, are on Windows and you're using Visual Studio, uh, you're going to want to get the latest preview release version of uh, Visual Studio 2017. That would be 15.9 Preview 2. You can get that from visualstudio.com slash preview. Or also, if you already have the preview channel installed, you can just update to the latest release. Now, all of these uh, installations are side-by-side -side installations with existing stable releases. Uh, I have on my machine multiple stable and pre-release versions of the .NET Core SDK. Mo I've had uh, like two different preview releases and a stable release of Visual Studio. They all work great side-by-side, -side, so you can install them without fear that they will uh, have any impact on your development workflow. So let me show you quickly how to go and do that. So let's just hop over to a browser real fast. To get the 2.2 uh, SDK, you're going to want to go to .NET and then go to the Downloads page. That's the Downloads tab, tab up top. And you should see this nice banner at the top of the page that says, if you want to try out 2.2, make sure you download the uh, Preview 2 uh, in installer. If you click on that link, that'll bring you to this page. And you're going to want to install the SDK uh, for your platform and architecture of choice. And then after you've done that, if you also want to deploy 2.2 applications to an IIS-based environment, you're probably also going to want to go over here and install the uh, runtime and hosting bundle. Once you've installed the SDK, you should be able to verify that things are all set up and working by going to the command prompt and typing .NET dash dash version. You should see a 2.2 version of the SDK for Preview 2. Uh, if I actually, if I run .NET, uh, dash dash info, you can see that I've got lots of SDKs installed. So like I said, these things are all side by side and they work great together. They uninstall cleanly. Now, if you're using Visual Studio, you're going to want to go to visualstudio.com slash preview and install the preview channel of Visual Studio to use these bits. Uh, if you already have the preview channel, just make sure you update so that you're on 15.9 uh, preview 2. OK, so let's create our first application. So I'm going to clear the command prompt here a little bit and let's do .NET new. I'm going to create a new web app. And let's put it in a web app one directory. And what this will do, this will create me a new ASP.NET Core 2.2 application uh, and just put it on my desktop. That will work on Windows, Mac, or Linux, so whatever platform you happen to be working on. If you're in Visual Studio, you can just open up Visual Studio, file a new project. And if you go to create an ASP.NET Core, ASP Core web application, click OK. In the new ASP.NET Core web app dialog, you should see that ASP.NET Core 2.2 is now available for you to, to use. Uh, go ahead and pick the default web application template, and you're good to go. So that's how you can create your first application. Now, in the project templates for this release, we've made a bunch of tweaks. Uh, in particular, for the default templates, if we look at the layout, you can see that we are now using, let's see if we can find it. There it is, Bootstrap 4. So our templates are now Bootstrap 4 based. Uh, so you get a nice, uh, uh, fresh UI. Uh, and in fact, we took this opportunity to go through the, uh, the, the template content, simplify things a bit, and give it sort of a, 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 ref, uh, a fresher look. So if I run this application, you can see the, what the new template looks like. Uh, we've basically tried to remove all the extra code and content that you don't really need. So there's less stuff for you to delete when you're trying to get up and going with your application. And this is what it looks like. So that's the new template. It's based on Bootstrap 4. Uh, a lot more minimalistic. We hope you like it. Uh, let us know what you think on, on GitHub. Other things that we've also done, if you're working with SPA frameworks like uh, Angular or React, if you go to create a uh, Angular application, I'll do that one real quick as well, uh, we've, tried, we've updated all of the uh, client-side frameworks as well. So the Angular application is now based on, let's see, if we go into the client app folder, packages.json, you can see now it's based on Angular 6. Uh, I believe Angular 6.1 has also recently come out. These frameworks move pretty fast. As much as possible, we will continue to update, update these templates to use the latest versions of the client-side frameworks. But for now, you can go ahead and use ASP.NET ASP Core with Angular 6. 
So that's how you can get started. Here are the new features that are included with, this, uh, with the 2.2 release. Uh, we've already seen the, the support for Bootstrap 4. Uh, that includes Bootstrap 4 support in the templates, but also in our scaffolders and in our default UI. Now, if you're still using Bootstrap 3 and you're not quite ready to move to Bootstrap 4, the scaffolders and the, and the default UI still support Bootstrap 3 as well. So you can still scaffold Bootstrap 3 content. You can still use the, the Bootstrap 3 version of the default UI. Um, Web API improvements is the big theme for this release. For 2.2, we really want to make API and service development easier and better. We'll talk more in detail about that in just a second. Other new features, we've added support for HTTP2 into Kestrel. Uh, we've added an in-process hosting model for IIS to have much better performance and uh, reliability. Uh, we've integrated a health checks framework into ASP.NET Core in this release so that you can make sure that your APIs and apps are, are live and ready for, for traffic. Um, we've revised uh, routing significantly in this release into a new routing system that we call endpoint routing, which has much better performance and also takes a lot of the concerns that are today handled in MVC and makes them available much lower in the stack. So for example, if you want to generate a link from a middleware, uh, you can now do that in, in 2.2. And finally, we've added a Java client for ASP.NET Core SignalR. Now, APIs are, are everywhere. Regardless of what type of application you are building, you're probably interacting with some sort of backend API or service. Uh, and that API or service may in turn be interacting with other APIs that may be hosted in your local data center, or they may be hosted in the cloud. In 2.2, we want to make API uh, development much better. So what are we doing in this release? Well, we're trying to make API and service development, uh, make APIs and services easier to create, uh, make them easier to test and to debug, uh, easier to document with standard specs like open API specs, uh, easier to consume, including things like client code generation, easier to secure, easier to monitor, and then all of the performance features, related features that we've done in this release, of course, also apply to APIs so that your APIs get faster and more efficient. Now, I'd like to show you what I mean. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to walk you through a development flow of building an API, testing it, and consuming it from a client application. And as I go along the way, I'm going to try and highlight the improvements that we've, we're making in uh, 2.2 Preview 2. And then I'll also try and point out areas where we're still planning to make additional investments uh, in, in this release. So let's go do that. All right, so let's go back to Visual Studio and let's create a new project. And what I want to create here is I want to create a, an API that's going to be an API for managing uh, data about pets. It's going to be a pets API. So let's call this pets API. Do I ever have a pets API project? Let's see. Looks good. All right. And then let's go ahead and use the API template for ASP.NET Core 2.2. Awesome. OK, so what does this template give me by default? Uh, honestly, not much. I get this very simple values controller, a very simple API that just, well, it returns a set of static strings or an individual string. And then the post, put, and delete actions, well, they don't do anything at all. But at least, at least they're there. This, this uh, API does at least use the new API controller conventions that we introduced in 2.1. If I run this application, what will it do? Well, it'll build. And then when it runs, uh, well, it just uses the browser to browse to one of the API endpoints. It browses to slash values and just returns the JSON. So that's okay. I mean, but with a browser, it's not the best tool for doing uh, API uh, testing and debugging. I mean, it really can only do get requests by default unless you want to write some code. Um, maybe we can, can do better. So what we're doing in 2.2 uh, in is we're introducing a new tool that we call the HTTP REPL. And it's a .NET Core global tool that you can install a machine that gives you a command line interactive uh, REPL for interacting with API endpoints. All right, so how do I get this, this tool? So you install it from the command line. It's a .NET Core global tool. So .NET tool install. And it's, it's, we're going to install it globally, so dash D to install it globally. And the version that you're going to want to get right now, now the, this tool is currently not available with the Preview 2 release that we just shipped. It's not currently on NuGet quite yet. It will be uh, in the next few weeks. Uh, so to get, if you want to get it today, you should be installing it from our uh, CI dev feed on, on MyGet. So the version you're going to want right now is 2.2. Um, dash, just pick the latest preview release, dash star. And then you're going to need to add an additional NuGet source in order to acquire this tool. Now, I, I'm not going to hand type that uh, uh, on the fly. I've got it copied over here. Let's go ahead and grab that. So there's the MyGet feed that you're going to want to use. Let's make this a little bigger. 
So .NET Core API, and then the, uh, the, the JSON file for the feed. And then the package ID for the tool is .NET dash HTTP REPL, okay? When you run that, that will then install the tool on your machine so you can then execute it. I've already installed it, and I can verify that by doing .NET tool list dash G to see all the global tools that I have in the machine. And you can see I've already got the HTTP REPL installed. All right, cool. So now I should be able to do .NET HTTP REPL. And that will then pop me into this uh, interactive REPL for interacting with API endpoints. Now, right now, it says it's disconnected. It's not connected to anything. Um, so what, what do we do? So we can use this REPL to talk to either ASP.NET Core APIs or really any API that you want. So for example, I could point it at the uh, GitHub API. So let's point it at api.github.com. All right, cool. So now it says it's connected. And if I run the help text just to see what this thing can do, you can see that from the REPL, I can issue any HTTP request for any HTTP method. I can set headers. I can, um, well, look, it looks like it has uh, information. It knows how to deal with Swagger documents. So if you have an API that has a, a open API spec or a Swagger document, the tool can light up additional functionality. For example, it allows you to traverse or navigate the URI space of your API uh, using file system-like commands like ls or dir and cd. So that's pretty cool. And then there's also a capability to run scripts. Like if you want to set up a bunch of REPL commands that you just run as a batch, you can run them all together by just creating a file. All right, so let's, uh, let's try this out. So I'm just going to clear the screen. Let's try just sending a GET request to the GitHub API. And I get a nice colorized response from GitHub. GitHub is a great API. They, they uh, are hypermedia based, so they, um, the responses give me a whole bunch of links that I can use to then traverse to other resources that are available through the API. I, I don't know. For example, look, here's the uh, emojis URL. So if I, uh, let's see, what is it? GitHub.com slash emojis. So if I do a get to emojis, that should give you, whoa, yeah, it gives me like a list of, a link to every single emoji that, that GitHub supports. And there are apparently <laughs> quite a few of those. And we're at the Z. So if I grab one of these links and pop it in the browser, supposedly, uh, if GitHub's doing their, their thing, then I should be able to see an emoji. Yeah, so there's the ZZZ emoji. OK, so that's pretty cool. Likewise, I can point this to my, um, uh, to my web API for ASP.NET Core. Uh, let's try that. So I'm just going to grab the base URL for my ASP.NET Core API. So set base. Let's set the base to there. Good. And then I should be able to issue a GET request. And you know, well, currently at the root, we don't have anything that's due to API slash, uh, was it values is their API? Yeah, OK. So I, I can use the REPL to, to test API. Now, this, this API is not particularly feature rich. So let's replace it with an actual pets uh, API that we can, can use. So let's go back to Visual Studio. And I'm just going to go ahead and delete this values controller. And let's create now a pet model that we can use to scaffold out our API. So right click, let's add a models folder. All right, and let's just add a class here, and we'll add a model for our pets. So let's call this pet.cs, and let's just add a bunch of uh, properties on here. Let's give a pet uh, an ID. Let's give it an owner. Let's give it a name. Let's give it uh, like a type, like what kind of pet is it? Is it a dog, cat? Uh, and let's give it also an age. All right, so there's our pet model. Looks great. Let's create an API, and we're going to use scaffolding to help us do that. So I'm going to add a controller, and I'm going to pick this API controller with actions using Entity Framework Core. So that, what that will do is that will inspect my model and then generate an API for me uh, using Entity Framework Core to manage the data. So I'm going to pick my pet model. Uh, I don't currently have a data contact, so I'm just going to go ahead and create one. And then pets controller for the controller name sounds great. So go ahead, Visual Studio, create for me my pets API without me having to write a whole bunch of code. And so the scaffolder runs. It's inspecting the, the model type. And let's see if that's going to work. All right, cool. And so this is saying that the app settings.json file got updated. That's just because it added a connection string for the database. And now I've got a much more feature-rich API. It's got actions for getting all my pets, getting individual pets, and then put, post, and delete. And these are action methods that actually have you know, code in them, like it's using a database context uh, to save data and, and manipulate data. So that looks good. All right. Um, now, one more thing. I want to switch the launch URL for this application to no longer be API slash values. In fact, let's just put it at the root. 
So, and I want to use my HTTP REPL to now test this, uh, this API. How can I do that? So I'm going to wire it up in Visual Studio. And the way I'm going to do that is by going to Browse With in the dropdown by the, the little Run button. And that will allow me to select which browser I'd like to use for testing my API. So instead of using the, like a normal browser like Edge, I'm going to use the HP REPL. So how did I do that? I just clicked Add, and then you specify the path to the HP REPL executable. You can see that down below. It's in your user profile under the .NET uh, Tools folder. And so that's how I set that up. So let's browse to our API using the HP REPL. All right, cool. So now I should be able to do a get to like API slash pets. And oh, this is probably going to crash because I haven't done anything with migrations because this is a this is this 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 app actually now has a, a database. So let's quickly run migrations. Let me run to the package manager console, and let's do uh, add migration. And I'd like to call my first migration initial. And I like to put my migrations in the data migrations folder. I like to keep everything under the data folder. So what that will do is that will generate some code for setting up the the tables in the database. And it looks like that worked. I can see the migration code is over here. And now we just need to apply that migration. So let's update the database with the migration. And that will allow Entity Framework Core to then run that code to generate a whole bunch of SQL for setting up the tables for my, uh, for my Pets API. I'll just give it a second. And there goes a whole bunch of SQL. OK, so now it should be all set up. And I should be able to reissue that GET request. One of the things I, re things I really like about the REPL is you just arrow up and re-execute. And OK, now we've got a, uh, an empty array of pets. We don't have any pets yet. OK, so how do I add some pets? Well, uh, I could do it also from the REPL right now. But the REPL can become much more feature rich if we actually enable Swagger for my API. Like give it an actual spec, an open API spec, so that the tool can figure out, well, what's the URI space for this API? What types does it expect? The HP REPL can help me with those things if it has that information. So what I'm going to do now is go ahead and enable Swagger generation for my Pets API. So let's go back to the project. I'm going to use a community project called Swashbuckle to enable Swagger documentation. So let's manage NuGet packages. And I'm going to add swashbuckle.asp.net core. And let's browse for it on NuGet.org. There it is. And uh, let's go ahead and install that. If you haven't used Swashbuckle before, it's a great open source project um, that, that does Swagger generation for ASP.NET Core applications. Um, this is the, the GitHub repo. And it's got actually some really nice documentation on the README for how you set it up. So now that the package is added, let's see, what do I got to do? Well, I got to add the Swagger Gen services. So let me go back to my API. And let's go ahead into the startup and go to Configure Services and add the Swagger Gen services. Let's change from my API to Pets API and just add a, the missing using statement. Great. OK, what else do I got to do? OK, I've got to make sure my API follows the right uh, programming model conventions so that it indicates what its HTTP methods are and so forth. I'm already doing that because I, I scaffolded my code. The scaffolded code from ASP.NET Core already follows those conventions. And now I just need to add the endpoint for exposing the Swagger document and also the Swagger UI. OK, so I add some middleware to my middleware pipeline. Let's use some Swagger. And then lastly, let's use the uh, Swagger UI. All right, cool. And again, let's change this name to Pets API. All right, awesome. So now if I, uh, I should already be rerunning. Well, one, one, actually, one of the, let me show you a nice feature of the REPL is that uh, once I've got Swagger generation set up, I should be able to just type UI. And it will bring me directly to the Swagger endpoint uh, for the API. Let's see if that works. And there it is. OK, so now I can see my, uh, using the browser, I can see all the uh, endpoints for my API. If I want to see the actual raw Swagger content, that's this JSON file that's linked from that, that main UI page. And this is nice. So I can do things here now. Like if I actually want to issue a post, this Swagger UI will help me do that. Uh, so let's try out doing a post. It, gives me, it knows the type information for the post action. So we can do things like say, like the owner of this, let's add a new pet. So the owner of this new pet will be me. Let's call it Spot. Let's say it's going to be a puppy. And let's give it an age of 1. And then set the content type to just normal JSON and execute that. And voila. OK, so we got a 201 response. And we've created our new, uh, a new, our new resource. Now down here below, you can see that the, the, the Swagger UI is showing me all of the responses that are supported by this endpoint that are advertised in the Swagger document. And currently it says, well, it returns 
well, actually, it says that it turns 200s instead of 201s, which is interesting. So it's not quite right. And I'm sure there's probably some error responses that it re returns that aren't uh, listed here. So, for example, if I go back and try and add another puppy, but instead of its age being 1, I said its age is ABC, which is going to be invalid, and execute that. Yeah, like I expected, I get a 400 response, and the uh, response body, oh, this is, this is nice. This is a new feature in Preview 2 of 2.2. We now return problem details responses by default for APIs, and we even include a nice uh, trace ID uh, so that you can correlate that error response to other activities uh, in your application. But that's not advertised anywhere in this Swagger document either. Why is that? Well, that's, those are things that Swashbuckle wasn't able to determine just by inspecting the application. So we have to do a little more work to add some attributes to make it aware of those things. And we can do that. We can go back to the pets controller and we could go to the, you know, the, I don't know, the post action and use the appropriate attributes. I happen to know that it's something like, I think it's produces, response type, and then you specify the status code and what type it returns. We could do that manually. That would be pretty tedious, and there would be no good way to enforce this across all of my API. So how can I do that? Well, one of the things we've shipped in with 2.2 is we've added an API analyzer that will look at all of your API uh, uh, actions and determine by convention what types of responses they should they will generally return, and it will uh, give you code fix-ups so that you can add the appropriate metadata. So let's let's add that anal analyzer. So I'm going to go to manage NuGet packages, and let's do Microsoft. This is the analyzer package, Microsoft ASP.NET Core MVC API analyzers, and let's go ahead and add that to our app. And that should help us out with uh, cleaning up our Swagger documentation. Right. Okay, cool. So now if I look in the, uh, the error window, you see that I'm getting all of these warnings now from the analyzer letting me know that I have action methods that are returning responses that aren't documented uh, anywhere on the, on the controller. None of the appropriate attributes are there. So let's, let's click on one of those. Uh, let's go to this one, for example, and let's, um, uh, we can right click and let's do a fix up. So if we use the analyzer fix up, Boom, so it adds all of the appropriate attributes so that the Swagger document is cleaned up. So the analyzer helps me enforce that my API is appropriately documented. Uh, but even, even so, it's still kind of tedious to go one by one to each action and add all these attributes. Uh, is there a better way? And the answer is yes. Uh, in 2.2, we've added some API conventions where we can determine this metadata um, uh, by, by convention. So if your action looks a particular way, we will go ahead and apply the appropriate attributes for you. Now to apply this particular convention, what you do is you add uh, API, I don't think it was an API convention and type, I think is what it's called. So I'm going to apply this, uh, the conventions globally across my assembly. You could also apply them per controller or per action. So let's see, assembly, what is it, API convention type, yeah. So I'm going to use the, we provide you a default set of conventions that are you specify using this default API conventions type. And those conventions match the code that's produced by the API scaffolder. So if I now, let's I think I can get a typo up in here. There we go, perfect. Okay, and now if I go look at my error list, suddenly all the analyzer warnings have disappeared and that's because by convention, um, the, the runtime is now saying, oh, well, all these actions match this pattern, so it provides you the appropriate, uh, um, pro a a effectively adds the appropriate attributes. Now if I go back to my Swagger document and take a look at it. Let's see if we now have a, a better Swagger experience. Okay, so let's look at like, so post, let's see. So yeah, so now post correctly says it returns a 201 or a 400 if you have a bad, uh, bad request. If I look at get, you might specify an ID that doesn't exist. So this should return a 404 and yep, now that's advertised. So those are all being applied for me and being enforced by the analyzer. If I deviate from these conventions, the analyzer will let me know. That's super nice. Now, if you don't like the default conventions that we give you, you can, of course, use your own. Um, they're pretty easy to implement. Uh, uh, these conventions are just implemented as a uh, static type uh, where the methods on the type basically define a pattern that should be matched and the appropriate metadata sh should be applied. So, for example, for a get, a get action, if you have a method, an action method that starts with get, this is a prefix match, uh, if your method starts with get, then it's saying apply these additional metadata attributes. If it also has an ID parameter, or at least an, a parameter named uh, su has suffix with ID uh, and is of any type, and in that case it will match and it will apply, apply the appropriate ap attributes. So if you define your own API convention type, the convention, the the analyzer will pick up that convention and help you apply them as well, similar to giving you warnings and such uh, over your code. So that's
So that's how you can have better documentation for your API. And so now I should be able to go back to my HP REPL. Uh, let's see. Let's uh, my cookie. Yeah. So let's uh, clear this. And let's see if we can get some more information. Yeah, so now when I do ls and cd, I can see the API uh, surface area, like the URI space. I can cd the API. Let's see what's here. Oh, there's a pets endpoint. That's super nice. And I can even see which HTTP methods are supported at, at, at each resource. I can see routes that take route parameters. Like I know there's one that takes an ID. So let's see, let's see if we can get, uh, get our, our puppy. OK, our puppy is there. Um, I could get like an individual puppy, like get one. That's the individual one. Let's add some more puppies now, or some more pets. <laughs> they don't all have to be puppies. Um, so let's post uh, a, a new pet. Um, I need to specify the content type of what I'm going to post. So I use dash H to specify I want to add a header. And a super nice feature here is we get uh, tab completion over the headers. So that's great. So just tab complete to content type. And then even for the, the media type itself, I can tab complete and say, yeah, this thing accepts uh, JSON data. So let's issue a post. When I issue a post, it pops up whatever editor I have configured and gives me a little JSON sample that I can now use to post a new pet. So let's again make this pet be mine. Let's call it Fluffy. Uh, what kind of type? This would be, a, let's say it's a tarantula. And uh, what age? You know, I, I hear surprisingly, tarantulas live a long time. Like they can live to be over 20 years old. So a 20 year old uh, tarantula. And there we go. So now if I do another get, I should have two pets. And I do. Let's add one more. And I can just go in, up arrow, and reissue a post request. Uh, what pet should I add here? Uh, this pet, uh, my, my mom actually, when she was younger, she owned a, a pet duck. So this will be my, uh, my, my mom's pet. Uh, and I think, I believe his name was George. He was a big white duck. And I don't know, how old was George? Don't know, say five. And so now we have uh, a bunch of pets. Okay. So there we, let's do we get. So now we can see all the pets. Uh, in our API. So that's super nice. That's using the HP REPL to, to test and develop um, uh, once you've enabled a good Swagger experience using the API analyzer and the API conventions. All right, so great. Our API looks like it's working. Let's now create a client library that we can use to consume this API. So let's go back to the project. Let's add a new project to the solution. That's going to be a just a normal .NET standard class library. So .NET standard. Let's call it uh, pets client. Looks good. All right, and we can get rid of this class dot, class one CS. And what I want to do here is I want to create some code that people can use to consume my API. So make it easier for them to, to consume my API. And I'd like to generate it based on the Swagger definition. So what I'm going to do let's let's add a, a a new item to the pets client class library project. It's just going to be a JSON file. And let's call it pets swagger.json. OK, so just a normal JSON file. And let me go back to my API and let's go grab the swagger document for it and just copy it in here. Great. OK, now I want, to, what I, I want to generate code based off of that Swagger document. And I like, like to do it as part of my build. Like uh, so every time I build this client library, I'd like to get the client code. And to do that, I'm going to use a really nice uh, community, uh, community project called nswag. So let's manage our NuGet packages. And the package I want, I believe, is nswag.msbuild. nswag is another great community project. There we go. Let's install this. It's open source. It's on GitHub. Uh, here's the project URL. Uh, and the nice thing about nswag is it supports both uh, open API spec generation or swagger generation as well as uh, code generation based on that, that, that specification. And it can generate you know, .NET code, C-sharp code. It can generate TypeScript code. It can even generate the API code if you'd like. Like if you want to have a spec that someone gives you and they say, like, please go implement this API, uh, you can do that with, with nswag. All right, so I'm going to wire up nswag as part of the build of my project. So let's edit the csproj file. Um, I'm, I'm going to, I've already got the target set up here in my snippet manager, <laughs> also known as Notepad. So I'm just going to copy that in. And so all this does is to find a new target that's going to happen before build. And it's going to run the nswag command line tool to generate some C-sharp cl client code from the Swagger document. And it, I pointed it at the petswagger.json file, specified the namespace. I've sp specified a couple of additional parameters. Like I'd like to be able to inject the HTTP client that it uses. So I've set that to true. Um, and then I've also specified the, what the output file name should be. OK, so let's save that. And now if I just build my API client library, Hopefully, I'll get some client code. Let's see if that works. 
build succeeded, and voila, we have a new petsclient.cs file with some generated code that I can use to consume the API. Now that whole experience of you know, acquiring the Swagger or open API spec for an API, um, pointing a, uh, you know, your build for a library to that document and having it generate client code for you, we want to make that experience a lot more seamless in 2.2. So in preview three, the next preview, we're uh, actually going to be providing some MS build infrastructure so that you can just add a package uh, and then in MS build say, I would like to generate a client for that project over there, kind of like a project reference. Or I'd like to generate a client for that API over there, like using a URL, and have that just work. And we'll be, we plan to be working with the existing community projects like NSWAG and Autorest uh, so that you can use the code generator of your choice. So that's coming, something to look forward to in, in preview three. Now it looks like I'm missing newtonsoft.json, so let's go ahead and add that. So our generated code compiles. And now we should be good. Yeah, okay, great. So now we've got our client library. All right, so now let's, um, let's uh, build an application with this. Like I, I mean, I work on ASP.NET, so I'd like to build a web application. I have a .NET class library. Um, I don't really feel like writing JavaScript right now. Uh, so for our client application, let's create a, a Blazor application. Now, if you're not familiar with Blazor, uh, Blazor is a, a relatively new experimental project uh, for running .NET uh, code in the browser. Uh, and it's run in the browser via WebAssembly. And I've got Blazor, uh, the Blazor extension installed in Visual Studio here, so I'm going to add a new project to my, uh, to my solution. That's going to be a Blazor app, so let's call this one Pets App. It's going to have some UI. And Blazor apps can run any .NET standard library, so they should be able to use uh, our, uh, our Pets uh, client. Okay, so it's, uh, the Blazor's not, not part of, of, of of 2.2, it's just an experimental project that we've been working on. Okay, so let's create a new Blazor app. I'm going to add it to my solution. Very cool. All right, and now let's just add a reference from my Blazor app to the client library that I just created previously. Generated from Swagger. All right, now I need to also, there's one workaround I am going to have to do with the Blazor app currently. This is something that we will be fixing in the future in order to allow it to work with Unsoft.json. It's just a temporary limitation, but I'm going to turn off um, uh, the uh, Blazor linker. This will make the app a little bit larger, but it will make um, more things work. <laughs> so we're going to do that quick workaround. I also need to now host this Blazor application. Blazor applications are purely client-side. They're just a bunch of static files. So you can host them wherever you want, you'd like. Um, I want to host this particular Blazor app in my ASP.NET Core app, in the uh, Pets API project. So to do that, I can just uh, add a, a helper package uh, for hosting Blazor apps in ASP.NET ASP Core. And that one is blazor.server. Let's go ahead and install that. Okay, and once that's in, uh, we need to add a reference from the hosting app to the Blazor application. Looks good. So let's add another reference to the Pets app from the Pets API project. All right, cool. So now I should be, go, be able to go into startup in my ASP.NET Core app and say app.useBlazor. And I'm just going to point it at the, um, the app, the, 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 program the program class from the Blazor application so it knows what to host. And that's all you got to do. All right, cool. All right, so now let, we should be able to use the pets client from our Blazor app. So let's go into the startup class for the Blazor application. And I'm going to add the pets client as a service so that I can inject it to any of my pages or components. So I'm going to say services.addSingleton. And I want to add the, was it, pets client. I think the name of the class is generated as dot client. Okay. And I'm just going to add that as a singleton uh, service. Um, Blazor, the reason why this works is because the, the generated client code takes in its constructor an HP client. And Blazor applications make HP client available as a service as well. Um, and it's already wired up with the right base URL. Um, and with the right uh, message handler so that it works in the browser. So when we resolve the pets client, it should get, just get the right HP client under the covers by default, which is great. All right, so that should be all we need to do there to make it available as a service. Now let's just add some code. So in my home page for my Blazor app, I'm going to write a little code here. Uh, let's do an I enumerable. I'd like to do I enumerable a pet. I think I need to add a using statement here. So using pets client. Yeah, so I enumerable of pet. 
I guess, yep, so I got some IntelliSense there. So this, let's call this variable pets. And then let's, on, when this page loads, let's just go ahead and use the pets client to grab all the pets data. So um, let's do a protected override. And on init async is what we're going to do because we're going to do an async call. So we should make sure we use the async version. So let's make this async. And then in here, let's just acquire all the pets. Okay, so I need a pets client now. How do I get that from this page? Well, it's just Razor, so we can use the, the normal at inject syntax, to which basically will create a property on this page of whatever type you want. I'm gonna, I want a pets client client. Uh, and let's call the name of the property pets client. So now I should just be able to refer to this pets client uh, anywhere in this code. Uh, so let's take the pets variable we created previously, and let's just populate it by doing pets client. Yep, getting IntelliSense. Dot, and what do we want? So the, the method names that were generated by NSWAG are based on the uh, URI path segments for the various endpoints. I want to just do a get, so API pets uh, get async is the one I want. And I don't have to pass anything because it already knows about the URI space, and that should be it. So now I should have all the pets. Now I just need to render some UI so I can see them. So let's add a little header here. Here's my pets. And let's add a little if clause. So if the pets are ready, like if it's not null, then let's do an unordered list here, and then for each, um, let's go ahead and do that, var pet in pets. Yep, getting IntelliSense, great. And then what are we gonna do? We want to generate a list item, and we'll put the pet name, pet.name. All right, if the pets are still null, like we haven't actually successfully loaded them yet, then let's just display a little message um, that says, uh, oops, uh, finding pets. Okay, and that should be it. Do we have everything we need? All right, all the squigglies are gone. Let's run it and see if that works. All right, so we're building the application. And this will build the, the Blazor app, which ref refers to the pets client. It then gets hosted in the ASP.NET Core application, which also has the web API. All right, it's so loading in the browser. Cool. All right, so our Blazor application is starting up. And if we look at the home page, it says pets, finding pets. And there they are. So there. So that was an end to end experience. So creating an API using scaffolding. Uh, adding documentation for that API using Swagger or an open API spec, testing the API using the HP REPL, uh, consuming that API using a client library with code that we generated, uh, and then using that from uh, uh, an application. All right, so to make APIs easier to create, we give you a scaffolding, and the scaffolders in 2.2 have been updated with the latest conventions. Uh, to make them easier to test, you can use the HP REPL. Uh, to make them easier to debug, we also, like I said, use problem details uh, responses with uh, trace ID, so you can track them, uh, correlate them with other activities in your system. Uh, document them using Swagger. The API conventions will help you do that, as will the analyzer, so that you enforce those conventions con consistently across your, your API. Uh, to consume them, uh, we are going to enable a code generation experience in Preview 3. That's coming. For now, you can use the existing uh, open source projects that are already available in the community. Uh, we are also planning to ship an authorization server-based uh, Web API security story in the next preview of uh, 2.2. Not much to share on that yet, but just want to let you know more is coming. Uh, as for monitoring, uh, you can use health checks to make sure that your APIs are live and that they're ready to receive traffic. I'll show more about that in just a bit. And as for performance, all of the new, uh, performance related features in this release, they of course apply to API. You can use HTTP2, you can use the new endpoint routing system, both which have uh, significantly better performance, and then also uh, IIS in proc uh, hosting. So now let's go take a look at some of those other new features. So HTTP2, that's also new in, uh, in 2.2. It's available cross platform in Kestrel. Uh, it supports ALPN, it supports um, header compression, and also multiplex streams. Now, this is great because it means uh, HTTP2 basically means HTTP, but more efficient, like faster, better, better performance. Uh, it is a new protocol implementation for us, so there are some limitations that you should be aware of. Uh, we don't currently support server push, and we don't currently support stream prioritization. 
Also, because this is a new protocol, similar to uh, if you remember Kestrel in its, uh, in its early days, we don't currently recommend using HTTP2 uh, with Kestrel on the edge at, at this time. It needs some more time to, to harden uh, and to bake. But it is enabled by default in, in 2.2 when you're using HTTPS, so we encourage you to try it out. Now let me show you what the, um, the impact of HTTP, HTTP2 is. So I have a little test application that I wrote. Um, Let's uh, pull that up. This app is uh, based on the, uh, if you've seen the, uh, the Golang Gopher Tiles uh, HB2 uh, test application, this is a very similar app. It basically is going to try to download a bunch of image tiles uh, from the server as fast as it can to render an image. All right, so let's go. I have two different versions of this app. I have an HTTP 1.1 version of the application uh, using ASP.NET Core 2.1, and then I have an HTTP 2 version of the application using ASP.NET Core 2.2. So let's start with the, the, the older one, the 2.1 version. So let's uh, set a startup project and go ahead and get that running and see what that looks like. Now, to make the, uh, the difference a little bit easier to spot, I've added some, um, some artificial latency to each of the requests, about 100 milliseconds of latency for each image request. Uh, so if things look like a little slow, it's not because the pipeline is slow, it's just because that's been, uh, uh, was artificially added. So as you can see with the HTTP 1.1 version, uh, you know, the tiles come down, they kind of look like they're you know, streaming in slowly. And that's because with HTTP 1.1, you're fundamentally limited by the number of connections that the, the browser will let you open. All right, let's now put that over here and let's try the 2.2 version. Let's set this as a startup project and go ahead and run that. All right, now let's pull that out side by side. All right, and let's control F5 so we can see what that looks like. And bloop! So it actually loads really, really fast. How is that possible? Well, this is basically the stream multiplexing in HP2 that's allowing you to get much faster load times. You can send multiple requests basically over the same connection. So much faster uh, DOM complete time on this one than on the HP 1.1 version. And we can, we can you know, refresh this a few times just to make sure we're not you know, slow because it's cold or whatever. Ooh, looks like that one took a little longer. <laughs> Let's give it a... There it goes. So there's, there's a much faster time. So I hit a little hiccup on my machine. So that's all. Hopefully you can see the difference there that you, get, uh, you can get some really nice performance out of HTTP 2. Let me stop the... Uh, Stop the servers. All right. So that's HTTP2 support. And like I said, it's on by default uh, as long as you're over HTTPS. It does require HTTPS. Uh, also new, uh, the new in-proc hosting model uh, for IIS. Uh, we had started work on this actually in an earlier release, um, uh, but we are now shipping it with 2.2. With uh, currently, when you host ASP.NET Core applications in IIS, it uses an out-of-process hosting model. Uh, what that means is request comes in to IIS and then it forwards the request to a .NET EXE process where your application actually runs. Now that has some obvious overhead in terms of performance. It also causes some reliability issues. If anything goes wrong with starting up that .NET EXE process uh, or if it crashes for whatever reason, your application then breaks and it's hard to figure out why. Uh, with a new in-process model, your ASP.NET Core app actually runs directly in the IIS worker process, which gives you much better performance and much better reliability. Uh, if things go wrong, it's easier to figure out why. So that's the main motivation why we're doing this, this feature. And the performance is looking really, really good uh, in our latest perf tests. Um, like, well, these were back in August. We're seeing like four times the performance throughput uh, for like a, 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 a benchmark where we're just turning a JSON payload using both the in-process model and the out-of-process model. So looking great there. To see it in action is pretty easy. Um, for this one, you really do need um, the latest version of Visual Studio, uh, 15.9 Preview 2. So let's go back to VS and let's go back to the project that we created at the beginning of the, of the session. This was just a normal uh, Razor Pages application. And what we're going to do is we're going to go into the home page and we're just going to print out the name of the current process. So let's add a, like a header element here and say, System.diagnostics process. Let's get the current process and print out the, the name. Nope, not the machine name, the process name. All right, great. So now, uh, if we look at the, um, the CS proj for this, uh, for this project, our templates now do specify in, in the, uh, the CS proj file that we should, it should use the in process hosting model uh, for ASP.NET Core when running on IIS. So by default, all the new 2.2 projects will have this. Uh, if we run this in Visual Studio, 
Uh, it seems currently that Visual Studio by default will, will ignore that, but uh, let's see. Fortunately, we can use VS to, to change it. Yeah, so currently it's saying it's actually running out of process in the .NET exe process. Okay, let's see if we can fix that, because I want that perf, I want the, the better reliability. So if we go to our project properties and go to debug, at the bottom you can see there's a new setting now for setting the hosting model. Currently it's specified as default. Uh, we can change that to say, to, to be in process. So if we save this and then go back to the application, and run the application, you can see now we are literally running directly in the IS, IS Express worker process, which is great. Better perf, better reliability, a lot easier to diagnose problems. All right, next let's talk about health checks. So new in ASP.NET Core 2.2, we've added support for, for health checks. Um, you can add dedicated health endpoints to your application so that um, container orchestrators and load balancers can figure out if your, your apps or, or services are live and ready to receive traffic. It supports health checks for both liveness, like is the, is the app even running, and also health checks for, um, uh, for readiness probes, like is the traffic running but not quite ready yet to receive, uh, to receive traffic. You can do both with uh, the health check system. So let's take a look at that. All right, uh, so I've got a little application here. Let's go ahead and close one of these. All right, a little application that uses health checks, so ASP.NET Core Health Checks 2.2. And um, the health checks um, uh, APIs are already included with the ASP.NET Core Shared Framework in 2.2. So like if we go looking through our dependencies, we can just search here actually for like health. And we can see that there, there's the uh, ASP.NET Core Diagnostics Health Checks uh, uh, package that's showing up uh, in my dependency graph. So it's already there, you can just use it. Don't need to add anything, at least when you're running on .NET Core. And then to use health checks, first you add the health checks services, and then any checks that you want to do. So in this application, what I'm doing is I, I have a health check that says, this app is only healthy if a particular required configuration value is there. If it's not there, the app isn't healthy. And this is intended to mimic a case like, for example, where you want to have a health check that checks to see is, is my connection to the database good? Like, is, is, it, is it set up and ready to go? You would do something very similar to that here. But to keep it simple, we're just going to check a config value and see if it's there or not. And then to add the health check endpoint down below in our request handling pipeline, we just say use health checks and specify the path where we'd like the endpoint to, uh, to be. Okay, so now, let's see. Uh, I have already gone and deployed this application to, to Azure as an Azure App Service. I've actually deployed it into two separate Azure App Services. I have one that's running in, um, in they're running in two different regions. One's running in Central US, and the other one is running in, in Western, Western Europe. Okay? And, and both of these have health checks enabled. It's just literally the same application. So if I do slash health, or is this guy healthy? Oh, currently it's unhealthy. That probably means it's got, uh, let's go fix that real quick. So that probably means the required config value is not there. Yep, so someone didn't deploy it correctly. And uh, let's save that. And okay, that should now be updated. And if we wait for this to refresh, hopefully in the, after the app has a chance to recycle, uh, it should now say that it's healthy. Give it a second for our app service to restart the app. Okay, so health. Okay, yeah, so now it's healthy again. That's good. So we got one healthy app. And then the one in Western Europe also has a health endpoint. We can click browse to that one and see that one's healthy too. Okay, good. Now I've also set up Traffic Manager in Azure uh, to uh, route requests to those two different applications uh, using the uh, performance routing method. So what does that mean? Well, the performance routing method means that it will pick which app will give you the best experience based on like, like what's, what will give you the best latency. So it'll generally pick the one that's closest to you. Since I'm in the United States, uh, it should generally give me the, the US version of the application. Let's see if that's the case. So here's the traffic manager uh, um, um, URI. This is a you know, DNS-based uh, uh, load balancing system. And if I re rerun this one, yeah, so it's routing me to, to central US, so that looks good. But what if central US uh, isn't working correctly? Like I say, I deploy the application to central US and that app is, is, is no longer healthy. So let's go back to the app and make it unhealthy again. So I'm going to take that required config and imagine someone you know, did it wrong and deployed a, a bad configuration for this app. Let's save. 
By the way, I should probably show how I configure this in tra Traffic Manager. So here's the two endpoints that I set up. And then if you look at the Traffic Manager configuration, in the um, endpoint mon monitoring settings section, you can see that I've specified the path for the health check endpoints to be slash health. And then it configured some values for like, you know, how many times should that health endpoint remain unhealthy before it actually does a, does a fall over logic. Okay, so hopefully, let's see if the, uh, Yes, okay, so now the US app is not working correctly because it's not configured correctly. And if I try and hit this in Traffic Manager, let's see if Traffic Manager is actually updated to say that it's unhealthy. Yeah, so now it's saying that the US endpoint is degraded. Do you see that? And if I go grab, I think normally it gets cached a little bit, so I find that it helps if I go to an in private window, go back to Traffic Manager, and now it's instead of bouncing me to the US, it's bouncing me to, to Western Europe. So that's health checks. Uh, you can use them to make your apps more reliable and easier to monitor. All right, endpoint routings next. So we are Im implementing a completely new routing system for ASP.NET Core 2.2 that we call endpoint routing. Um, it is on by default in a 2.2 application as long as you, you've set the compatibility mode to be 2.2, which means it even replaces the existing routing system. Uh, and the nice thing about this new system is it has much better performance. It has about a 10 to 15 percent uh, uh, throughput perf improvement, and it's also much more scalable. We've been testing this uh, routing system using uh, actually the uh, the open API spec for like all of Azure, like all of Azure's management plane, which, you know, thousands of endpoints, and it scales great uh, even to that many of, of, of endpoints. It's also really nice because it moves the routing concerns lower in the stack so that you can use them in more places, including outside of MVC. So for example, if you want to uh, generate a link uh, from middleware to some endpoint, you can do that with the new endpoint routing system. It also includes a bunch of other minor improvements. It has a feature called tra uh, parameter transformers, which lets you transform uh, route values. So like if you want your action names to be snake cased, you can do that. Uh, we also added a, uh, a new catch-all syntax with two stars, star star, which will um, encode everything that gets captured except for the slashes so that you can more easily round trip uh, um, your UI paths that, have, that contain slashes. So new endpoint routing system, uh, it's kind of laying the foundations right now for even additional work that we want to do in the uh, routing space. Uh, so you should expect to see even more uh, improvements coming in future previews and future releases. All right, the last thing I want to show you is the new uh, ASP.NET Core uh, Java client. Um, we have a new uh, uh, Java client library that you can use to connect to ASP.NET Core SignalR hubs. It's available uh, for Gradle and also for, for Maven. Uh, and it uh, is starting in Preview 2, it now also supports the Azure SignalR service. So if you want to write a, an Android application that's written in Java using uh, uh, SignalR to add real-time capabilities and you want it to scale, you can use the Azure SignalR service to, to do that. We have a really nice uh, Android sample uh, using the Java client that you can take a look at, and I'll show you that next. Okay, so I have Android Studio installed here. Uh, with the, uh, the Android, uh, the, the SignalR Android sample already wired up. If we look at the uh, build.gradle file, you can see here's the, there's, uh, let me highlight it again so you can actually see it. There's the SignalR library being added as a dependency. So column.microsoft.aspnet uh, uh, colon SignalR. This is the preview one version. We need to update that to preview two, but the code is basically the same. If we look at the main activity.java, you can see that it just looks like the normal SignalR client. You create a hub connection to a hub. Uh, here I have a hub that's hosted on Azure. And then down below, it's listening, for, has a callback for receiving uh, send events from, from the hub. So when someone sends like a chat message, it can then update the, the UI. And then down below, if uh, the user clicks a button and sends its own message, it uses the hub connection to send that message to all the other connected clients. All right, so let's, let's try it out. So I've got the Android emulator up here and running. Let's go ahead and fire up the application. And in parallel, let's go ahead and let's browse to the web version of the client. So I think that's at uh, signal our samples hubs.html. Great. So this is just a little web client that uh, talks to the same, same hub. And I'm going to connect from the web client. And you can see in the Android version, it's recognized that another user has joined. And so from the Android app using the Java client, we can say like, hello. Uh, .netster, and send that, and down below, see so we got that message in real time in the web app, and then from the web app, we can say, 
hi, Mr. Android, and broadcast that, and we get the message from the, from the Android, Android client as well. So that's the new Java client, uh, and like I said, it supports the Azure SignalR service. Uh, give it a try. All right, so those are the new features available with 2.2. Uh, hope you enjoyed uh, learning about them. What is the roadmap for the 2.2 release? Well, we shipped Preview 2 in September, shipped today. Uh, we expect to ship Preview 3 uh, um, about a month from now in October, and then we hope to ship an RTW, a stable release of ASP.NET Core 2.2 uh, by, by year end uh, of 2018. And I hope you enjoyed what you saw and that you'll take the time to go install the latest .NET Core SDK, uh, 2.2 Preview 2, uh, and try out these new features. And it looks like we have a few minutes, so I will do my best to try and answer a few questions. All right, so any plans to provide updated templates for Vue.js? If not, how easy, easy is it for the community to create these templates? So we currently have SPA uh, templates for Angular, for React, and React plus Redux. Uh, we have actually done Vue templates in the past. Um, you know, these fr Java JavaScript frameworks, they move very quickly. There's quite a bit of maintenance cost in keeping those templates up to date. So we've scaled back actually to just supporting Angular and, and React, at least for the ones in the box. Um, in the future, we actually plan to take the, even those templates and move them in, to be just shipped as template packages, as NuGet packages, instead of having them actually in the SDK so we have the ability to be more agile and update them as the client library's uh, version. Um, we don't currently have plans to add uh, support for Vue or, or Aurelia or any of the other frameworks. If the community would like to have the, build these templates, you absolutely can. Uh, anyone can actually create a template pack as a NuGet package, ship it to NuGet.org, and then you can install them by doing .NET NuGet i and just point at the uh, package ID for the package. So if the community would like to maintain a Vue version, that's, that would be totally great, and uh, people should absolutely do that. I'm sure the code for the uh, version of the Vue template that we used to have is still kicking around. Uh, that would probably be a good, good starting point. Uh, next question, to, uh, can we experiment with, uh, with .NET Core 2.2 in Visual Studio Code? Uh, yes, absolutely you can. Um, the main reason why we recommend using the latest preview version of Visual Studio is because there are, are features that light up with that, with that preview release. Like, for example, being able to use the new improc hosting model when you're uh, uh, building and debugging your applications, that, that support was added in the latest preview version of Visual Studio. Also, the scaffolding support so that you can scaffold both Bootstrap 3 or Bootstrap 4 uh, versions of, uh, of UI for ASP.NET Core that was added in the latest preview release of Visual Studio. But you can still do development with any editor that you'd like. If you like Visual Studio Code, absolutely. You can .NET build, .NET run, .NET publish, all those things, get IntelliSense, those things, the, the runtime features and the framework features will of course continue to still work. So the next question was about, the, uh, about Swagger and the HP REPL, uh, that they seem to have overlapping concerns. Uh, do we really need both? Uh, and I think the answer there is absolutely yes. Like depending on how you like to work, some people like to have a GUI UI. They like to be able to, to point and click and see, see pixels on the screen when they're doing uh, the development flow. Other people really like the, the productivity of a command line interface uh, that's, that's scriptable, that you can just up arrow and repeat, uh, repeat interactions. Um, the Swagger UI is also very generic. Like it'll, it's based on whatever you can learn from Swagger. With the HP REPL, we think there's also opportunities for us to do things that are more .NET specific, to add value um, to specific to .NET scenarios. For example, um, in the past, we've looked at like exposing log information directly from the HP REPL when you get like a 500 response from the server. We could do that for a .NET application. Uh, we don't necessarily uh, can't necessarily do that uh, generically from the Swagger UI. Uh, so that's why we think there's value, but you know it's 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 early in that that tool's life. So let us know what you think. Uh, next question is: Are there any options for managing secrets like connection strings with passwords, etc., other than Key Vault? Well, I would certainly absolutely recommend using Key Vault for whatever secrets you're trying to, to manage. Like Key Vault has you know, a great set of security features for making sure your secrets don't end up going where you don't want them to go and helping you manage that. So Key Vault is great. Uh, if you're not interested in using Key Vault, um, uh, for development scenarios, you can certainly use the uh, user secrets uh, uh, feature that we have in, in ASP.NET Core to make sure that you don't accidentally check secrets into your source code. It's not really a... Um, like an encrypted secret store, it's just a way to sort of uh, have a layer of indirection so you don't accidentally put things like passwords or connection strings directly in code that end up on GitHub. Um, if you're running on Azure App Service, you can use things like uh, environment variables 
for, for storing secrets. Those are sandboxed so that they only stay within that environment. But still, I would highly recommend using something like Key Vault if you have a, a very sensitive data. And that's pretty much it. We're getting to the end of time. Thank you, everyone, for, for watching this session. Uh, if you have additional questions or feedback about these features, please let us know by filing issues on GitHub. <laughs>